Rachel, you've argued that an understanding of the evolution of cognition, emotion, even consciousness uh, can have a, a richer data set by looking at creatures that normally we don't associate um, uh, a c cognition or emotion or, or certainly not consciousness uh, that are non-mammals. Uh, what, what's your argument? Yeah, so um, let me just back up for a second. So um, in uh, the paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould famously says, if you rewind the tape of life and you play it again, what would you expect to get? And he argued that you know you would get a completely different shape of animal life. His argument was sort of focused on bodies, but it's really interesting and was really provocative because of its implications for the evolution of mind. And so, you know, I think that was the most sort of high profile casualty of Gould's radical contingency thesis. The idea that you reran the, the tape of life again, you, you know, it's unlikely that vertebrates would have survived. And as a result, uh, there would be no complex cognition, consciousness, uh, and, you know, um, uh, uh, and, and other kinds of properties that we associate with, with um, complex intelligence. So that was Gould's argument. And I think you know, there's been a, a lot of pressure on that argument um, coming from this phenomenon of convergent evolution. And the idea is you know, convergent evolution, which is this similar, you know, in the, the independent replication of similar biological forms and functions. And um, it's particularly important uh, when you're thinking about questions about rewinding the tape of life and you know the questions about universal laws of biology, it's particularly important to see that the initial conditions that are resulting in the same outcome, the same kinds of convergent outcomes, are very, very different. Um, because if they're very close, then it's not that surprising that they would end up in the same place, mm -hmm. right? So if you're starting with something like mammals, you know, uh, after the you know the extinction of the dinosaurs, and then they diverge into a bunch of different um, groups with extraordinary intelligences as they have for like whales and dolphins and um, um, primates, um, elephants and so forth, right? They're still starting from a very rich cognitive sure. platform, okay? So what you really want to see, if you really want to show the deep replicability of mental properties um, of the sort that we're talking about, you want to see the evolution of minds uh, from radically different starting points. Okay? And that's where invertebrates come in. So invertebrates are really important because, so you know, vertebrates and you know, other invertebra invertebrates and invertebrates like mollusks and arthropods, which include insects and crustaceans and um, spiders and millipedes and so forth, myriapods. Um, these animals share a common ancestor that was brainless, eyeless, was not an active organism. It was essentially like a relatively undifferentiated worm uh, you know, somewhere around 600 million years ago. Um, and yet independently and in rapid succession, they evolved complex forms of sensory modalities, complex image forming sensory modalities um, in, in those three lineages through vision. Um, and then that sort of through a feedback process um, interacted with the evolution of information processing capacities, namely brains and also active bodies at the same time to create these um, extraordinarily agentic lineages that we see today. And so you get this feedback process between <clears throat> these complex image forming sensory modalities like vision and brains and active bodies and sort of an, in a ratcheting effect ends up creating minds at least, you know, at least three times as can be inferred by the independent Evolution so of central. About three times. Obviously, yeah. vertebrates is one. Yes. And, and then arthropods. So, so arthropods were actually the first. Okay. Vertebrates were the second. Okay. And cephalopods a little bit later, but okay. all relatively early in the history of, uh, of animal life. Uh, okay. Um, and that's right. And so, what's the implication of that? <clears throat> well, the implication is that it, since they all, you know, evolved those states, these centralized nervous systems with complex behaviors. Um, uh, as evidenced from all sorts of experimental work in experimental psychology and comparative cognition, um, you know the 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 implication is that you know very different starting points will lead you to the same outcome. You say the same outcome. 
Uh, how are you defining same? Yeah, and I think that's one of the classic problems when you're thinking about questions of contingency. You say, oh, well, you know, if if conditions were a little bit different, they would result in very different outcomes. Well, what does it mean to be very different? <laughs> what does it mean to be very, you know, right. some only a little bit different in right. the initial conditions? Right. Right. Um, and so that is that's a deep question. But I think what you see is a very deep structural analog in arthropod, cephalopod, mollusk, and, um, and vertebrate minds, which is the creation of what, uh, what I call an umwelt, um, adapting an old uh, German biological context, uh, concept into the, uh, the evolutionary context. And, and what does umwelt mean in your it's context? It's basically the idea that you know, you're, you're able to create a model of the world that's essentially you know, um, a, dist a, a, a spatial distribution of objects that are bound with all sorts of features. Um, they're experienced as a unified whole with the subject of experience at the center. And um, you know, the objects themselves <laughs> retain their identities over time. They're imbued with all sorts okay. of features. And that's what allows these, these, these lineages to act in ex these extraordinarily agentic ways. And most important, not most importantly, but also importantly is the fact that they're also that also bound in these objects is valence. So the, the 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 goodness or badness or neutralness of these mm -hmm. objects is critical to the evolution of agency. Um, it's critical to the evolution of welfare, and I think it arose independently in these three groups. W what you're saying, though, is based upon a, uh, a definition of mind. You're using the word mind, you're using <clears throat> the word uh, uh, you know sensory reactions. And uh, in a sense, bringing in as an assumption a phenomenology experience, yeah. a consciousness experience. Uh, and those are very different categories. Lots of people yep. argue those yep. in different ways. Yep. Your position is that there is ge genuinely mind there. And by mind, you're bringing in some kind of phenomenology. It, it doesn't have to be. So I, I don't think anyone has been able, you know, we haven't made pro, uh, progress all that much on the hard problem of consciousness. I'm not convinced we will. Um, mm -hmm. I change my mind every day. <laughs> um, you, you can couch all of the things that I've said in purely cognitive and representation, representational terms. But here's the deep structure. The deep structure is in these image forming sensory modalities, you're basically having life make use of a limited form of waveform energies over and over and over again to construct these three-dimensional topographic spatially distributed mm. scenes of objects. That's been done with the light sense through vision, but also through echolocation and through electrolocation um, to the, the same extraordinary effect, creating these scenes, uh, either acoustic or electrical scenes of bound objects um, with the subject uh, of experience at the center. The experiences are different for presumably the phenomenology, if it exists, is going to be different for you know, echolocating animals like bats mm -hmm. and dolphins and also for um, uh, electrolocating fish. But the deep structure of their cognition and their umwelt is the same as it is for vision.